I'm hoping that you can all hear me. Everything okay? Great. Good morning and welcome to St Andrew's Morning Worship. It's so good to be with you as we join together as a community online and on the phone. I'm Becky. I'm one of the ordinands in the parish. And today, though scattered and in our homes, we all come together and worship God. So let's take a moment to turn our attention to God, bringing our whole selves. Let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people, we have gathered. Let us worship him together. As always, at the beginning of our services, we come to our confession. Knowing, as I said already, that we bring our whole selves to worship today. Let us take a few moments to think honestly about how we have lived our lives recently. Call into mind moments when we have not been the best we could have been. We come to God as one from whom no secrets are hidden to ask for his forgiveness and peace. And so we pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Turning our attention to the theme, we use the church's prayer for today, the second Sunday before Advent. Heavenly Lord, you long for the world's salvation. Stir us from apathy, restrain us from excess, and revive us in new hope that all creation will one day be healed. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading for today is taken from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, the first 11 verses. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. 
We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll hand over now to Dawn, the other Alderland in this parish, for our gospel reading and her sermon to us today. So our Gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. Matthew, chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five talents to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five talents more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, I've just read the parable of the talents, as it's well known, from Matthew's Gospel. We've also heard a section from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians about the day of the Lord. And if you've read the Old Testament passage for today, it's from the book, from the book from the prophet Zephaniah and it also talks about the day of the Lord. Taken together all three could be read and they have been read as only talking about judgment, the great and terrible day of the Lord which is to come. Zephaniah describes it as a day of wrath, distress and anguish. Paul describes it in terms of destruction that comes suddenly, like the onset of labour pains. It's difficult stuff to read and it's difficult stuff to think about. And I don't think we should shy away from that. There are many different interpretations around judgment that we'll find within the Christian church. And some, to be honest, are more helpful than others. But I wonder if we misread some of these parts of scripture when we concentrate on an idea of a terrible and harsh judgment that is to come. If we think about the master's reaction and words to the third servant outside of the wider context of the parable, outside of the wider context of the gospel, and indeed the whole Bible, it can throw our focus off somewhat. This Bible that tells us of God's unfailing, unending, absolute love. This Bible that tells us that God gave himself to the cross for us. This Bible that tells us that we are not and never will be left alone. The parable of the talents comes within a section in Matthew's Gospel that starts with Jesus telling the disciples that the stones of the temple would not remain. And the disciples then asked Jesus when and what will happen at the end of the age. We then get a fairly lengthy narrative in response of which this parable comes in the latter stages. The really important point that we can easily miss in this section of Matthew's Gospel is the absolute certainty that Jesus will return. There is no question that Jesus will be returning. There's no language of maybe, it's a strong possibility, highly likely. It is definite. Jesus will return in glory. It it may seem an obvious point to make, but it does seem to me so important to keep this at the forefront of our thinking when we look at passages such as this. I don't think the emphasis is on judgment, but on Jesus' return. Paul's emphasis is on the salvation that has been won for us by Jesus on the cross. We have been appointed not to suffer, but to live in the hope of Jesus, in the salvation of Jesus in the faith and love of Jesus. There is no doom or gloom there. We are called to live in the light, to live as children of the day and children of the light, here and now. And we can do that because we know the promises of Jesus are true. Paul's message is one of joy and hope and celebration. We may feel in our current situation that that's really difficult to hear and live out. And it is true, it's easier to say sometimes than do. But we must hold tightly to Jesus, perhaps even more so in these times, and hold tightly to his promise that he will be coming back. And that, I think, is Paul's message, that when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, there is certainty and solid ground. 
So the parable of the talents is telling us that Jesus will return. The master returned. But I think there is also something to be understood about the generosity of the master and the response of the servants. The master entrusts his wealth to his servants. He could easily have taken his wealth with him, made his own investments. He could have entrusted it to someone more qualified with the know-how and the connections. But he chooses to entrust his wealth to his servants. Jesus has entrusted his church with a mission. Our time is not to be idled away aimlessly as we wait for Jesus to return. We have a job to do. And as Jesus has entrusted us with a mission, so he has also equipped us well for the task at hand. What we may miss in the parable in in our reading and our lack of knowledge of the original audience is the significant amount that is given to the servants. A talent was a vast amount, estimated between to be worth between 15 or 20 years of an average labourer at the time. The servants here are receiving vastly more money than they would ever have seen or thought that they may possess in a lifetime. Even the third servant is given more than he can really imagine, even though it seems less than the others. God is generous, is the point. And he has chosen to entrust us with the responsibility of his wealth. And the parable tells us that Jesus has shared his wealth with his people now. Sometimes I think we can fill our vision only with the eternal, with heaven, the life to come. So much so that we forget the present. We should be expectant for Jesus' return. And we will shortly be entering into Advent, which is the church's time of preparation for his return. We can be certain of our citizenship, that is, with Jesus, but not to the extent that we forget the here and the now. We can be certain of what will be so that we can attend to what is. The servants receive talents now, to use and live within and enjoy in the moment. We are not just about heaven and what will be. We must also have our eyes fixed on the present and the responsibility we have been given in the now. Our waiting is not passive but active. It is not to sit back and go to sleep or get drunk as Paul warns. There are things to do. The servants here have been given responsibility in this interim time. It is a responsibility of using the gifts that God has given each one of us for the building up of the people of God, both those who know and love him and those who do not yet know him. Paul says, encourage one another, build each other up while you are waiting. Two of the servants did something with what they had been given, And they heard the affirmation, well done, good and faithful servant. The point for me is that the third servant chose to do nothing. Now we need to be careful here not to fall into an understanding that what we do brings salvation. We do not work to receive our salvation. It is not a story about effort and work and reward. The more you do, the more you get. That is not where the parable is taking us. The issue is not that the third servant had not multiplied the original sum. It was that he had done nothing to use it. The first and second servants hear the same well done. Whether the prophet is large or small, the response from the master is the same. Well done, good and faithful servant. Our salvation has been won by Jesus. We could not, we did not earn it through works. But the note here for me is that the first two servants responded positively. The third chose not to engage, but to bury his gift. 
God has given gifts to each one of us. No one has been left out. So I wonder whether the point of the parable is not to be seen in the monetary amounts, but in the fact that the servants were given different. We are all different, and that's something we should be given thanks for, in my opinion. We have all been gifted differently, not in any hierarchical sense, not in any preferential treatment sense, and not in a measure of how much we do as a marker for getting into heaven. We have been gifted differently because we are all needed and we are all necessary. Remember Paul's use of the body language. We need each other. If we were all gifted the same, it wouldn't be useful or frankly interesting. We need each other. And we are all called to different roles in the life of the church, but as one body. If you think you are not needed or necessary, please hear this morning that you are. You have gifts that are needed by the church. Sometimes we need help from others in understanding what our particular gifts are. And if that is you, I would encourage you to talk to someone or contact us here at St Andrews. We have all been gifted. And if we decide to bury our gifts, the people of God will miss out. Jesus has equipped his church for the mission of the church. And we have to decide, each one of us, how we will respond, whether we are prepared to use the gifts for the good of all or whether we choose to bury them. Now, these passages do contain questions about judgment and it's not that I want to ignore that this morning. Let's remember what Ken said a few weeks ago on Bible Sunday. Um, We need to pick up this book We need to read it, we need to wrestle with it, we need to reflect on what it's saying. Not least because someone may ask us questions, and particularly around the idea and concept of judgment or a day of the Lord. And yet for me, far more important is to live in the certainty that Jesus will return in glory. To hold that truth closely And let that invade every part of our lives. And the question for each of us to to consider is, what will be my response? How will I choose to walk forward in that knowledge of the certainty of Jesus' return? Amen. Thank you, Dawn. I'd like to give us each a moment, a moment of silence, or however you'd like to do it at home, to ponder our own positive response to the generosity and love of God. Let's take some time. As part of our collective 
response. Let's join together to declare our faith as one people before the one true God. We say it together. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to hand over to John and Karen to do our prayers. Let us pray. As we start our intercessions today, may we remember that we are part of God's family. Whether we are listening on the internet, by phone, or later on during the day. Some of us may be feeling isolated during this lockdown, but we have to remember what a friend we have in Jesus, who is always there to listen and respond to our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we have been called to pray for our nation, whatever our faith, loving God, at this time of crisis, when so many are suffering, we pray for our nation and our world. Give our leaders wisdom, our health service strength, and our people hope. Lead us through these parched and difficult days, through the fresh springs of joy and comfort that we find in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the scientists who have hopefully found a new vaccine for COVID-19. When it is finally ready, we pray that all people will receive it regardless of them being able to pay for it or not. We pray for all of those who work in education at this time, as classes and schools have had to close due to people having to self-isolate. We pray for those families where children are now at home. We pray that these homes will be a place of love and peace. We think of families who may be struggling financially especially those where school dinner may be the only male meal of the day. May we support our food banks as they see an increase in the number of people coming to them at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church throughout the world and give thanks that we are able to worship freely and without persecution. We pray for our church and all the staff Ken the vicar and our ordinands, Dawn and Becky, the parish office staff, Arlene and Jackie, Carol and Pat, our lay readers, and many others. Thank you for their calling to serve God and us. As we are in lockdown, bless the work of our pastoral team as they reach out to so many in need. Lord, in your mercy. This week, the Third Horn Church Girls' Brigade Company would have been celebrating its 50th anniversary. We give thanks for all the girls and leaders that have been involved in it during this time. And we thank you, Lord, that so many girls have come to know you. Our motto says, may we all seek, serve and follow Christ. We pray for all other youth organisations who have been unable to meet since March and for the outreach work they are continuing to do, to keep in touch with all their members and spread, spread God's love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless those who are suffering in body, mind or spirit, and those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. May they know that you are always with them, 
that your love surrounds them and may your goodness give them confidence, hope and peace in their time of need. At this time of lockdown, 50% of family carers are experiencing isolation, loneliness, depression and stress. May we make an effort to reach out to any family carers we know by telephone or email, just to show our support and love and break their cycle of isolation. Lord, in your mercy. As we come to the start of another week, Lord, we thank you for the week ahead. We know that you will be with us every step of the way. Give us strength, wisdom and guidance. Help us to be a blessing to others as you are to us. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers for, for the sake, sake of your, your Son, our, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. We now say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. It's our favourite part of the service, I'm sure. It's time for the notices. So I'll start now so that maybe they can filter through if anyone has anything to celebrate. Um, with massive congratulations to anyone celebrating any special occasions this coming week. Um, I'm sure you'll have a wonderful time, um, even though there's a small issue of lockdown. I hope you enjoy your special day or anything that you're going to be doing. Um, a reminder that we have morning prayer on our Facebook page, Monday to Thursday at 9 a.m. And that the church will be open on Thursday for private prayer between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Our parish office is still open, can be contacted by phone or email. The details can be found on the website. And also on the website is a number for the pastoral care team. Um, so if you need prayer or anything like that, then do use that number. Do make use of that. And an additional number that's also on the website, but I will give it to you now as well. Um, for anyone who is without an online option, um, please pass it on to anyone that you think would benefit. Uh, it's the Church of England's Daily Hope phone line. Uh, that number is 0800 804 8044. I'll say that again, just in case. 0800 804 8044. So that's the Church of England's Daily Hope phone line. Um, another Church of England initiative um, as mentioned in our intercessions, is that we are being asked to join together those scattered to pray at 6 p.m. each day during November. The resources for this are on the Church of England website. There is, of course, family time, another highlight of my Sunday, that's on straight after this service um, on the Facebook page. And if that's not what you fancy. There's also coffee and chat. If you can try and do both, that's also incredible. Um, so the link for coffee and chat is in the events section of the parish Facebook page, I believe. And we come to thank everyone for financial support during this time. Many of us are stretched with finances the church is too. We have continuing costs. And so we thank anyone who feels able and willing to give at this time. 
There's a donate button um, on the website. There's the parish giving scheme details on the website. Um, and checks can be sent in to the office made payable to Hornchurch PCC. Um, but for now, let us give thanks for the financial offerings that have been received this week. Lord God, you are so generous to us. And we thank you for all that you give to each of us. We thank you particularly for all that has been received this week. May it be used for your glory and for the work of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. As a closing prayer, I'm just going to use a, a set prayer. Um, I think it fits really well with today's theme. Um, so I'll just use that. Gracious God, you have given us much today. Grant us also a thankful spirit. Into your hands we commend ourselves and those we love. Stay with us, and when we take our rest, renew us for the service of your Son, Jesus Christ. May God give to us and to all those we love his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy, in this world and the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. So, wherever you are, go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.